Welcome to today's webinar, The Guests That Won't Leave, How States Are Dealing with Invasive Species, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Melanie Condon. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar today on invasive species. Today's webinar is hosted by NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee, and it's part of the committee's 2015 Spring Webinar Series. We'll be holding webinars on a variety of topics each Friday throughout May and June. Uh, we encourage you to check out the complete schedule and registration on our website at www.ncsl.org. My name is Melanie Condon, and I'm the Policy Specialist for the NRI Committee. I'll be moderating today's webinar, where we will explore how states and the federal government are dealing with invasive species. Before we begin, I want to review a few quick housekeeping items. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and everyone can access a recording of it um, on our website at ncsl.org. We'll also be sending around a notice shortly after the, web, um, the webinar with a link to the um, recording and to any resources we discuss on the webinar. Also, you can download the webinar right now. Um, the slides are in the right-hand corner of your screen. There's a yellow um, page with a blue graph in front of it, and if you click on that, it's our media library. You should be able to download the slides. So today, um, our pres presenters are going to be answering questions after their presentations, but you can type your questions into the question box on the left side of the screen at any time during the webinar. I'll be moderating um, the question and answer, and I'll be monitoring your questions. So, also, you know, everyone who signed on today is involved or hopefully interested in the issue of invasive species, so I wanted to make you all aware that NCSL just this morning published a web brief um, of state actions related to invasive species. It's on our website, and after the webinar, we'll be sending out that link around. So we encourage you guys to check it out um, and ask NCSL staff with any questions. So without further ado, um, let me introduce our first speaker, Mr. Sash Virgil. Assistant Director for Prevention and Budgetary Coordination at the National Invasive Species Council. The NISC spans 13 federal departments and agencies to ensure federal programs to prevent and control invasive species are coordinated, effective, and efficient. Sash serves as the NISC policy lead on issues related to preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species, with a focus on the pathways for their movement. He oversees the collation of information on NISC's member agency budgets related to invasive species issues. Additional areas of interest and activity include the role of trade agreements, links to climate change, and multi-level stakeholder coordination. Josh, I'll turn things over to you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Melanie. And uh, first off, good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're calling in from. And uh, secondly, I'd like to, to thank NCSL for this opportunity to talk. Uh, state legislatures are a very um, sort of critical piece of the puzzle, and I think, as uh, hopefully you'll see as I go through my presentation, you'll see why uh, we think that our relationship with states um, is getting more and more important, and hopefully that will be sort of reflected in some of the future activities that we're involved in. For my presentation, uh, I'm going to try and do two things things within the space of uh, plus or minus 20 minutes. And, and one is just a, a little bit of background on NISC, the National Invasive Species Council, its structure, and then using the framework of our management plan, sort of the broad overarching objectives, get into some of the issues that uh, NISC as a council is working on, some of the federal agencies are working on, um, with a specific orientation towards how that intersects with activities at the regional level or at the state level. Um, so hopefully that will give a good linkage into the subtitle for this uh, overall webinar, which is how states are dealing with invasive species. And I realize I'm talking from the federal perspective, but again, one of the key questions for us is how do we, um, as federal agencies as well as NISC, relate to work that's going on with the states and cooperate um, as we all try to address problems related with invasive species. So first, uh, going into a little bit of background on the council, and this might also be of interest uh, because a number of states have developed their own variations of invasive species councils that in some cases are modeled on the national uh, setup and in other cases vary uh, in terms of structure, participation, funding, et cetera. But sort of getting back to the beginning, in 1999, under the Clinton administration, 
there was Executive Order 13112, which basically, one, set out a definition for invasive species. Two, it established the council itself. Three, it established a, an invasive species advisory committee. And this is under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that committee in a bit, but that's one of the ways that uh, we get input in um, to the federal agencies from states as well as an, uh, a range of other stakeholders. Then the final thing which the executive order did is it provided some additional guidance. Uh, first and foremost, the instruction to develop management plans to guide federal activities. And then the second one, which we've been paying increasing attention to, which we sort of call the do no harm rule or principle, it's basically that the activities of federal agencies should not make invasive species problems or make existing problems worse. So in that sense, uh, doing no harm by invasive species. Turning to the structure, as Melanie mentioned, we have 13 federal agencies that are listed as NISC member agencies. The co-chairs are the secretaries of Agriculture, Commerce, and Interior. And for Commerce, that's primarily run through NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, so those are the three co-chairs. And then a range of other agencies like Defense, Treasury, the US Trade Representative, Homeland Security, EPA, are involved in NISC. Now, I should say that. Uh, depending on sort of the area of activity and even depending on the year, the level of involvement of these various agencies changes. Uh, the other thing to note is that the executive order isn't ex um, exclusive in terms of the involvement of other federal agencies. So we frequently uh, liaise with the Smithsonian, both from the side of their collections and systematics, as well as their Environmental Research Center, which does a lot of work on ballast and aquatic issues. Similarly, uh, we're, we're starting up discussions with the National Science Foundation. So um, this is sort of the, the, the primary list that's written in the executive order, but again, it's not exclusive. The council, which is again those secretaries for those agencies, is serviced by a secretariat or a small staff uh, consisting of an executive director and uh, myself and others as a program staff. Lori Williams, who had been the executive director, retired in September. So right now, we're in the process of hiring a new director. And they would have at least four program staff. And finally, I'd mentioned that this um, family of federal agencies is advised by the Invasive Species Advisory Committee, which is about 30 plus or minus individuals not all non-federal, some from state government, some from academia, some from industry. And with that group, we try to have a diverse geographic representation, a diverse skill set, uh, diversity of expertise across taxa and invasive species issues. And their specific mandate is to provide recommendations to NISC and the federal agencies, either as a whole or individually. And that Advice can generally take two forms. Sometimes it's forward thinking. Uh, several years ago, we did a piece on, uh, they did a white paper on biofuels, which has informed a number of the subsequent discussions that have happened with EPA as well as USDA. E-commerce is another area that they looked at in terms of a white paper. And then uh, in addition to such kind of horizon scanning issues, sometimes it's very specific input on things like the Forest Service Invasive Species Manual or work that I'll be talking about in a little bit around early detection and rapid response. So now I'm going to move to more of the, the substantive side and less of the sort of process and structure set of issues. As I mentioned, NISC activities are generally guided by a management plan. There have been two iterations, one in 2002, one in 2008. And right now, we are revising the next iteration of the management plan. The, the categories you see up on the screen, prevention, early detection, and rapid response, control, eradication, rehabilitation, 
coordination collaboration are common to any number of plans, whether it's from other countries, from states. So those themes should look fairly similar to you. Um, then again, sort of the devil's in the details in terms of well, what are the specific activities that are under those. For the purpose of this presentation, uh, and given its orientation around what um, states are doing in a, in a bit in terms of how federal agencies are working with states, um, I just wanted to provide sort of two uh, caveats or a little bit of context for the comments that I'll make. One, I'm by no means referencing all the elements of the management plan. I'm just picking out those that I think are a little bit more interesting or relevant. And then two, while well, a lot of the work that I'm referencing and I'll sort of state where is work that either NISC is doing or the federal agencies are doing, in some cases I will be highlighting work by states or other partners that either NISC is tracking, NISC has provided input into, or that for some other reason we see as being sort of particularly important as we sort of work on this relationship between state and federal agencies. And then finally, I just wanted to, to highlight the uh, invasion curve. That's the graph that's on the page. In general, you know, we, we try, as is sort of the conventional wisdom within the invasive species community, to move things towards prevention as being the most uh, cost-effective approach towards dealing invasive species. But that's recognizing that we do have invasive species that are established and have populations that likely cannot be eradicated at this point in time or with existing resources or technologies. And so control will still be one of the, the critical elements in the toolbox. But again, um, always looking towards how can we sort of you know, move down the curve to, to more towards prevention and um, putting our resources there as opposed to in longer term management. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go into the, sort of the specific themes that I'd highlighted and a little bit more of the, the work that, that we've been doing and are doing. So with regards to prevention, the key focus there, um, two focus, are one is pathways and one is risk analysis. On the pathways side of things, and I realize it, it might be a little bit difficult to see the smallest of text in these two diagrams, but in 2005, 2006, uh, a work was done in collaboration with the Aquatic Nuisance and Species Task Force to identify the, the panoply of pathways by which invasive species enter and are moved around within the, in the country, uh, principally by means of, of humans, human-mediated movements. Recently, we have gone through that and revisited that set of diagrams, added some new things, shifted things around, but basically there are three major categories in terms of the, the human aspect of that. There's trade and living industry, transportation, and then infrastructure and management. And what the graph shows, if you look at the upper right corner and the arrow down to the lower left corner, is um, when you specifically get into the area of trade and living industry, you can get into plants, into animals, into horticulture, and that sort of the, the pathways get more and more refined as you go down that that tree structure. This is something that's on the web. I realize that I have not included the URL, but that's something that I can provide in, in the future. And once our, hopefully our, our web system and our, our website is revised, the idea is to link the specific pathways with existing management guidance, whether that be state regulations, federal regulations, best management practices, but basically to have sort of a library of the, the types of management tools that are associated with specific pathways. Two other more specific areas that, uh, and examples of pathways that we're working on, one is development assistance, and that's the, the financial and the project assistance that the U.S. and other countries provide to developing countries. Uh, in the past, we've worked with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, with the African Development Bank, and right now the World Bank, which is sort of the, the mother of development banks, is revising its set of safeguard policies. And those are the environmental and social uh, criteria or rules that projects have to follow. And so we've been working actively with them to make sure that invasive species considerations are part of that mix, such that they're not introduced deliberately if it's 
agroforestry projects or they're not uh, unintentionally introduced or spread by other means. Another example that we're getting off the ground is looking at hydraulic fracturing. And uh, about a year ago, the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force highlighted this as a priority. And we're um, establishing a small group, both of federal and non-federal folks, to look at the risks that are presented both from the aquatic side in terms of movement of water for fracking activities, as well as the terrestrial side for the movement of, of vehicles and stuff like that with the aim of coming up with uh, best management practices. So that's just some of the examples on the, the pathway side of things for where we're active. Uh, another example which I wanted to raise, which uh, for, for NISC is it's a much broader effort than just the, the council and some of the federal land management agencies. It's the, the process is called building consensus in the West. And that name was, uh, I think, developed by states in conjunction with work with the Sea Grant National uh, Law Center. And it stems out of the basically the concern of the spread of quagga and zebra mussels into western states. There was a workshop in Phoenix in 2012, which brought together law enforcement, state attorney generals, states, uh, federal land management agencies to, to look at the issues of boats, trailer boats moving from infected water bodies through the West, uh, inspection, decontamination programs, information sharing activities, law enforcement activities. So the full suite of activities that are sort of associated with that particular pathway. And that set of concerns also is reflected within the uh, Quagga Zebra Action Plan that was developed by the Aquatic News Species Task Force. So this effort, um, and, and I think it's, it's a very good example of state-state collaboration as well as state-federal uh, cooperation has morphed into two, um, two prongs or two themes. Obviously, work among the states. There have been a number of follow-up workshops, both on the technical side in terms of looking at watercraft inspection and decontamination, as well as on the policy side. So uh, with the assistance of the Sea Grant Law Center, uh, developing a model legal framework, looking at what states can do now, so sort of a state-by-state -state comparison, and ultimately thinking about how to sort of harmonize and, and allow for states to communicate with each other about the issues associated with um, the movement of potentially contaminated uh, boats and trailers. On the federal side, and a lot of the concern here stemmed from uh, Lake Mead and other water bodies that, that might be infected and being a source of invasive species then moving in and through the states. And so from the federal side, it's sort of similar work of training and outreach, funding at uh, federal land management units. And then more specifically on the policy side, looking at the range of authorities, including legislation, regulations, and internal policies and guidance that direct the land management units on what they can or cannot do. And so w with the idea of seeing, are, are there gaps out there? What are the present set of practices? And again, looking more towards harmonization and the ability to work more effectively with states in the future. Um, so this is sort of really taking a critical look at, at both how the, the federal land management units and states work on a particular pathway. Shifting to early detection and rapid response. Um, probably the, the, the biggest thing which has um, come into our work program of late actually derives from the, the climate change field. And back in 2014, the White House released a priority agenda for enhancing the climate resilience of America's natural resources. And in there, it specifically tasked, and I don't expect you to uh, read all of the, the, the blueprint, but the light blueprint has the, the key elements, um, specifically task NISC and the Department of Interior to develop a framework for national early detection and rapid response, uh, specifically to help support states and tribes, and then also to look at developing a plan for creating an emergency response fund. And this has been a very interesting exercise because conceptually we can say this is what an early detection rapid response program should do. But when get into the details in terms of how do we support existing efforts 
Um, a lot of work is going on at uh, the state, the local level, as well as the regional level. Uh, how do federal agencies fit into that? And are we, um, how do we sort of build the capacity for those existing systems, but also think about at the end of the day, if we can have a rapid response fund, how would folks apply to that? So we've, um, this product is due in September, and we've developed two groups. One is a federal working group, and then the second is an advisory group, and that's working through our advisory committee and it specifically has an EDR subcommittee. And so within that group, there are a range of folks from states, from tribes, uh, a couple folks from industry, as well as academia. And I think we're, we're glad to see that this, um, this issue, which has been sort of recognized as, as, as important for quite a while, now has some additional hooks. And the final thing is, is also seeing how it fits into the climate change agenda as well as the, the resilience of natural resources. Turning to the next area, control, eradication, and rehabilitation. Uh, I should preface this by saying that, that NISC, um, in terms of the staff and um, quite a bit of the, the, the focus of the, the management plan, doesn't go into details on species-specific work, which is a little bit ironic because all uh, invasive species work on the ground is species-specific. Uh, I think our recognition is that various agencies uh, sort of have the purview over that uh, unless there are major issues that, that cross multiple agencies. That said, there are a number of, of issues that, that we do pay attention to. First and foremost, as I just mentioned with EDRR, is the climate change dynamic. And so at the request of the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, we developed a report with a suite of federal and non-federal experts specifically looking at the tools and methods and information that might be useful for natural resource managers when thinking about how to manage invasive species in the context of climate change. With regards to species-specific work, a number of the NISC agency members are very active on a full suite of species, uh, carp, I mentioned quagga zebra mussels, snakehead, uh, USDA has been very engaged in feral swine. Another issue which um, is very much on the minds of uh, the environmental community in the West is the sage grouse. And so we've had sort of been following discussions in terms of well, how to cheat grass, other invasive grasses, and fire interact to threaten sage grouse habitat. And again, while we don't work on those issues specifically, we sort of follow them because sometimes there are sort of either interagency connections to them or sometimes broader sort of political um, movements at play. And then finally, I just wanted to note that uh, in addition to the species specific work, we follow regional work. So the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force uh, involves a number of federal agencies, but I think it's particularly notable as an example in terms of how there is, in my view, a fairly fluid connection between uh, or across the federal agencies, the state agencies like the Florida um, Wildlife Commission, and then regional or local agencies like the South Florida Water Management District and the universities there. Obviously, Florida is one of the sort of ground zeros for invasive species, and they have um, some significant challenges, like you know, how do you detect a, a Burmese python. Um, and, and what we try to do is sort of, A, look at the needs for those type of um, initiatives, as well as what are the, the lessons that we can learn from them. One of the things that the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force has that we've been talking with them about is a cross-cut budget. And they're looking at, ex at uh, expenditures on invasive species from both the, the side of federal agencies as well as state agencies, looking at uh, animal as well as plants. Uh, NISC has its own cross-cut budget, which looks across the, the range of federal agencies across a number of categories. And so having an idea of what expenditures are going on at the local level and being able to, to use that as an example and thinking about what expenditures are happening at the, the federal level helps provide a, a perspective on how overall financing for invasive species tends to break down. And sort of the, the final 
kind of element that I'm going to get to uh, is the issue of coordination and collaboration. And essentially, all of NISC activities, given the staff, is coordinating work across agencies or with, with other partners. Um, but this section of the, the plan kind of gives us uh, a little bit more flexibility in terms of other things to, to bring into that, um, into that area. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about within the revision of the current plan is how do we better integrate regional efforts. And I already mentioned work going on in South Florida and the Everglades. Obviously, there's a large amount of work going on in the Great Lakes, uh, and it's been going on for several years with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. This is another area where a significant amount of funding has been funneled in through the EPA. And if you look over the past three or four years, this has sort of been in the plus or minus $50 million mark for invasive species, which in this day and age is, is a, a good amount of money. Uh, one of the questions has been, how does the work that's going on in the Great Lakes uh, benefit other areas of the United States? And so looking at tools like eDNA and its application, some of the rapid risk screening or rapid risk assessment methodologies are also useful. Uh, looking at some of the partner work, the, the Great Lakes Commission and a number of uh, academics and NGOs in that area have developed a web, web crawler for organisms in trade and looked at comparison of state lists for invasive species that are prohibited or regulated in one way or another. And the interesting thing about this is some of the things like the web crawler is not something that the feds can do very easily in terms of some of the regulatory implications. However, the information that is garnered from that can be very useful to further inform any sorts of enforcement efforts. So a lot of these things, while being led from the ground or from the region, um, can service both the, the state and the federal perspective. Two other regional sets of activities that I wanted to mention. One is in the Pacific, and that's a development of a biosecurity plan for Micronesia and Hawaii. So it includes the US territories in Micronesia, as well as the, the countries in Micronesia, as well as Hawaii. And it's looking more comprehensively at how do we do prevention and early detection and rapid response. And recently, the US assumed the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And while this only really involves the, the, the state of Alaska, uh, it also gets to the point of how do we cooperate with other countries in the region on invasive species priorities. And then the, the final substantive slide I have is just simply on outreach. And we rely on both a, a range of formal and informal means to sort of get the word outside of, of Washington and to talk with states and other stakeholders. Uh, some of the uh, more formal elements that we have are one involvement with National Invasive Species Awareness Week, which usually happens in February or March, uh, bringing together folks both in DC for meetings and the ability to talk to federal agencies as well as their uh, Congress folk on the Hill. Um, and now increasingly, how do we engage NESA type activities in the rest of the country? We also, with the National Conference of State Legislatures, operate a, an invasive species listserv, uh, which is not exclusively targeted towards states, but that's recognized as one of the key constituencies. And then finally, uh, a webinar series, which is every month or every other month, which we do in conjunction with the Environmental Law Institute. And just a, a final note, um, this is a picture of the man behind the mask. And I do, you know, doing, doing my little bit, I do get my hands dirty. Uh, I think the, the one final thing that I want to say, from the perspective of being in DC, we deal with a lot of policy frameworks. Um, conceptual notions of invasive species. Sometimes they overlay very well with what's happening on the ground, and sometimes there are disconnects. And I think the ability to talk to states, talk to people in the field, to interact with folks at the regional level is very helpful, because that helps give us a reality check. So if there's anything that in this presentation you'd like more information on, I'd be happy to address that within the question and answer period, or you can alternatively give me a call or email me at the address above. And with that, I'll turn it back to Melanie. Great. Thanks, Josh. Very informative. Look forward to hearing um, you know, some of the questions we, have, we will surely have for you. Um, so now let me turn things over to one of NCSL's own members. Um, she's Staff Vice Chair of NCSL's NRI Committee, 
Hope Stockwell. Hope's a nonpartisan research analyst for the Montana Legislative Environmental Policy Office, where she's worked for seven years. She's drafted legislation establishing and revising the Montana Aquatic Invasive Species Act over the past four sessions. She also staffs committees on fish, wildlife, and parks, and federal relations, energy, and telecommunications. Between sessions, Hope staffs the Environmental Quality Council and provides training on the Montana Environmental Policy Act for state employees and the public. Hope, the floor is yours. Thanks, Melanie. Glad to be here. I do want to acknowledge I have two additional people here with me to help answer any questions that might come up. Uh, Linnea Schroer is a statewide aquatic invasive species liaison with the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And then Celestine Duncan, who is a contractor, she's worked extensively with our state agencies on aquatic invasive plants and has helped develop a statewide strategic plan for management and resource protection. Montana's fight against noxious things has raged for decades, so I'm very happy to report we don't have Florida's problem with Burmese pythons. That really grosses me out. Um, but we do have plenty of leafy spurge and spotted knapweed to go around. Today, though, I'm going to be talking uh, about Montana's relatively new fight, though, against aquatic invasive species. This hit our legislative scene in 2009. And keep in mind, we only convene every other year. And I'm going to walk you through the evolution of our Aquatic Invasive Species Act in the last four sessions as legislators have responded to emerging issues and then also political wind shifts regarding best practices for inspecting boats and other equipment. The first legislative champion on this issue was Senator Verdell Jackson, a Republican from Northwest Montana. His district includes four lakes, most notably Flathead Lake, which is southwest of Glacier National Park. It's touted as the largest natural freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. That's if you consider Red Lake in Minnesota and Lake of the Woods in Canada to be north of the Mississippi. But in any case, it's about 28 miles long, up to 15 miles wide, and has a surface area of about 190 square miles. Gorgeous place. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil, or for short EWM, an invasive plant, was discovered about 100 miles to the west of Flathead in Noxon Reservoir. And concern was mounting over recreators moving EWM around between the lakes and other areas. There was also concern about visitors coming from the eastern United States and the southern United States, snowbirds returning to the north um, that might be carrying zebra and quagga mussels from Lake Mead or the Great Lakes areas. And it got the attention of Senator Jackson thanks to a stakeholder group in the area. And though the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks had had an aquatic nuisance species program there for five years or so at that point, he'd never heard a word about it. He was very concerned. So in 2009, he came and drafted legislation to create our Aquatic Invasive Species Act. He wanted it first and foremost to launch a public education campaign, because in his words, without cooperation of the public, we were going to fail to keep mussels out of Montana. The bill also authorized establishment of aquatic invasive species management areas. That's where check stations could be used to inspect and decontaminate boats. They would ask questions about where people were going and where they'd been with their boats to get some sense of recreators' habits. And then they'd also be doing education, handing out pamphlets and things to raise awareness about the issue. The management areas could be for specific locations or a body or bodies of water. But they also gave authority to make the entire state a management area. And there would be rules to um, establish how watercraft could move within to or from the areas, uh, how they needed to be cleaned, what kind of bait and things you could carry. The responsibilities were given to the Departments of Agriculture and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. There was an appropriation of about $900,000 that year as a one time for the biennium. Uh, but more than 70% of the money was from the State General Fund. Senator Jackson knew that could be a tough sell. He and his co-sponsor in the House hauled around this piece of pipe that Jackson said had been in Lake Mead for two months as a cautionary tale. It got people's attention for sure. They also passed out brochures and maps showing the spread of zebra and quagga mussels in the United States. You can see here on this map, there's a, just a little red dot. That's Lake St. Clair between Lake Erie and Lake Huron uh, in the first year. So that was June of 1988. A year later, they had spread to the western part of Lake Erie. Five years later, they'd really made some moves. Here's 10 years later. So obviously, the mussels had some clear pathways, as Dosh talked about, along um, waterways. People were moving them around. Senator Jackson argued, as Stosh already said, that prevention is way better than trying to control the mussels once they've arrived. He and his, 
his co-sponsor talked about the billions of dollars that had already been spent in the Great Lakes areas trying to deal with the problem there. So Montana has 50 senators and 100 representatives, and the bill passed 44 to 3 in the Senate on final reading and 86-14 in the House. So it had a lot of support. That first year, the summer of 2009, the AIS program conducted more than 1,000 watercraft inspections at 18 different water bodies, and then they also had five border check stations. And then the second year, the program more than quadrupled its numbers. And they also added uh, the first management area for Eurasian water mill soil around the Knoxon Reservoir Cabinet Gorge area, which borders Idaho. Um, it's just west of Flathead Lake, as I said earlier. In that management area alone, they conducted nearly 7,000 inspections. There were two check stations in the Montana area, and then a third conducted collaboratively with Idaho. They were also monitoring sites around the state, 600 sites that year for aquatic invasive species. They found several new infestations of Eurasian water milfoil, including two along the Missouri River, which was really a concern for folks. Um, there was also a mussel scare in 2010. That was when routine plankton samples taken from Flathead Lake seemed to contain mussel larvae. Uh, further examination failed to turn up any further evidence of the exotic mussels, though, and things have been all clear so far. But when the legislature reconvened in 2011, people were nervous. Senator Jackson wanted to put more teeth in the Aquatic Invasive Species Act, and so um, he, he endeavored to write a new version. The big thing was that his 2009 bill only allowed for the inspection of the exteriors of watercraft, though it was clear at that time that interior portions of a, of a boat could hold uh, water and, and had places where mussels can hide. They can last for days in those humid conditions. Authorizing mandatory inspections of boat interiors was on Senator Jackson's radar screen in 2009. It was heavily debated behind the scenes while he was drafting his bill. But there was a lot of concern with interior searches about unlawful search and seizure issues, invasion of privacy. One possible solution that was talked about multiple times was quarantine, using invoking quarantine powers to overcome those issues. Um, uh, because of the inherent agency authority and the case law that comes with quarantine. Senator Jackson was on board. He wanted quarantine, but the governor's office did not. There was a real fear uh, that Montana would be perceived as being closed for recreational business and that visitors would be deterred. Some other ideas were batted around. One was requiring residents to sign a waiver for an interior search of their boat when they registered it with the state. Um, but that wouldn't capture non-residents. It also wouldn't capture people who were borrowing somebody's boat and didn't actually own it. So nothing really measured up from a legal perspective except quarantine. But again, there wasn't the political will in 2009. In 2011, when Senator Jackson came back, the legislature was ready. There were two AIS bills that time. Both contained quarantine provisions. Senator Jackson sponsored one, and then another came from a, an appropriations subcommittee. That was the bill that was ultimately successful. And the subcommittee thought long and hard about putting quarantine in the bill draft. Again, they were concerned about invasion of privacy or stumbling onto other things in a boat that might be illegal but not related to the AIS inspection. In the end, though, the bill authorized quarantine provisions because the legislators felt so strongly about being able to look at the interior portions of boats and make sure they were dry and clean. As a counterbalance, though, um, the bill repealed the authority to establish a statewide invasive species management area. It was the way the legislature thought they could keep the quarantine from getting out of control, or the risk that it would get out of control. So that meant that mandatory inspections and the interior inspections could only occur in areas where an invasive species management area had been specifically created. The subcommittee did a couple other things with its bill as well. It put together a funding package of about $2 million. Almost half of that was general fund money. And then they also brought the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation into the program. On its own in the previous biennium, the DNRC had used some of its money to hire a dredge to combat Eurasian water milfoil in certain locations. And the subcommittee was imp impressed with their initiative. Lastly, the subcommittee added uh, to the list of things that could be inspected, trailers. It seemed like an obvious move. If you're inspecting the boat, let's look at the trailer that the boat is on. And in the final form, the bill passed 90 to 7 in the House and 50 to nothing in the Senate. So large support again. But in 2013, when the legislature came back, again, there were questions about the efficacy of Montana's inspection program. 
without the ability to have the statewide management area, because that had been nixed in 2011, those, those mandatory inspections were limited to these uh, established management areas. There were three in 2012, as you can see on this map. And the legislature felt like that just wasn't going to stop the primary threat of non-resident visitors and protect the whole state. So sophomore legislator representative Mike Cuff took up the charge. He passed around this muscle-encrusted shoe during committee hearings for effect. And his bill made three primary policy changes. It reestablished the statewide management area. It rolled the Department of Transportation into the program for further cooperation and collaboration. And then it added equipment to the list of things that could be inspected. And again, this was a big deal and raised concerns. Equipment was defined as an implement or machinery that had been wholly or partially immersed in surface water, including but not limited to boat lifts, floating docks, pilings, dredge pipes, buoys, lots of stuff. And people were worried, again, about the overuse of the quarantine powers. Cuff promised there was going to be no intent to look for anything other than the aquatic invasive species. And he related the story from Idaho about why he felt it was so important to inspect equipment. There was a truck in an Idaho check station. It was carrying this block-like cargo. And it looked like it had some watermarks on the side. And the inspector noticed that. And he got permission to look a little further. And it turned out the blocks were floats that had been in water on a construction project in Nevada. And they were internally infested with mussels, um, which could have been a big problem. And so Cuff was uh, very adamant that we needed to start looking and inspecting equipment. Um, his bill contained $1.5 million in general fund money for that coming biennium um, to support the program. And as he said on the House floor, he said, a yes vote costs money and adds regulation. A no vote can be catastrophic. And in the end, his bill passed 88 to 11 in the House and 47 to 3 in the Senate. With Cuff's bill, it was an extraordinary funding year in 2013 for AIS, the AIS program. In addition to his funding, uh, there were other bills that added more general fund money and also some natural resource production tax money. It was a grand total of $2.8 million that biennium. Part of that was a spot of money, about $300,000, to control an outbreak or targeted at controlling an outbreak of Eurasian water milfoil in what we call the Jefferson Slough. It feeds into the headwaters of the Missouri River. It was found in 2011. And um, there's stories that it could be the result of a fish tank having been dumped in the river. No one knows for sure. Um, the legislature honed in on that, though, because of its location at the headwaters of the Missouri. And they felt that if you can't get rid of the uppermost infestation, there's no hope of helping downstream areas. It takes only a four-inch piece of Eurasian water milfoil to start a new infestation. So it doesn't take a lot. A group of legislators and interested stakeholders went down to the SLU that summer in August of 2013 to take a first-hand look. It was the second summer that they had been doing hand pulling of the weeds in the SLU. They used workers from the Montana Conservation Corps. There's a nearby mine. Uh, the Jefferson County Weed District and the Broadwater County Conservation District all contributed hands. They pulled out a total of about 6,000 pounds of Eurasian water milfoil, uh, but with an estimated 28,000 pounds at that time remaining, hand pulling was declared futile. And they're actually developing a new plan that will use herb herbicide treatments, but also ultimately fill in the current channel of the slough and dig a new one, um, a new route for the irrigation water that it, it channels, just because the problem is, is uh, so difficult down there. The 2015 legislature just wrapped up its session. They made a few tweaks this time to the Aquatic Invasive Species Act. They had some language to clarify co-location of border check stations at the Department of Transportation facilities as much as possible, and then authorized other entities to enter into agreements with the state to operate check stations in an effort to stretch resources and cast the net further. In eastern Montana, for instance, it's been difficult to find workers because of the Bakken oil boom. There's also a second bill this session that created an invasive species trust fund. It can receive gifts, donations, grants, et cetera. And they hope to build a $10 million corpus, the interest from which would be used to provide grants and contracts to communities for invasive species management projects. The problem is no money was actually appropriated for or transferred into the trust fund. But it's there as a tool in the toolbox, which stakeholders felt was a really important option to start seeking funds from uh, interested parties and continue working on this issue. The legislature did appropriate nearly $2 million in general fund money for the General Aquatic Invasive Species Program. 
for the biennium, but again, it's one time only money as all the other appropriations have been. And so there's continued talk about how do we secure ongoing sources of funding. The trust fund was one idea. Um, in Idaho, they have a boat decal program. It generates more than a million dollars a year for that state's program. That's been talked about here, but it hasn't, hasn't gained traction. Um, so I think funding in the future is really going to be what Montana is looking at in dealing with the issue for the future. Um, just an update on our inspection program. At this point, in 2014, they had more than 34,000 watercraft inspected. It was the highest number yet. The majority of the stations operate between the Memorial and Labor Day holidays, so they start some up earlier in the year along routes that snowbirds use. Um, of the watercraft inspected last year, about 1%, which was 454 watercraft, were fouled in some way. Standing water that can carry mussel larvae was the biggest offender, um, followed by vegetation. They actually did find mussels on three boats in Montana. Fortunately, they were all dead, but they did um, you know, clean those and decontaminate those boats as a safety measure. 21 of the watercraft carried Eurasian water milfoil, and 16 carried another problem offender here, the curly leaf pondweed. So Montana continues to be on alert. Um, share this parting shot of the most recent map I found of the quagga and zebra mussel sightings in the western United States. Um, and uh, so the concern is there. These five states in the Northwest, Montana being one of them, are really working hard to keep quagga and zebra mussels out of our area. And um, just a, a little plug for an upcoming, if you're looking for more information on uh, invasive species aquatic in particular, um, Penoir is having a conference in Big Sky, Montana coming up in July. It starts July 12th, and I believe it's on the 13th. They have two sessions. Uh, during the day, in the morning, in the afternoon, on aquatic invasive species, if you're going to be in the area or attending, um, that they uh, are are going to be having and having, and you might find useful. Um, that's all I have, Melanie. Great, thanks, Hope. Um, so we'll go ahead and start our question and answer session. As a reminder, you can type your questions into the chat box on the left hand side of your screen at any time. We'll only be taking questions from the chat box, not through the phone. So go ahead and put them in there. Um, I think I'll take kind of the first couple questions as moderator and um, throw some out to you guys. So, Hope, for you, um, you know, what kind of has been the public reaction to the various iterations of the Montana bills? Has everyone been on board or has it been seen as like a hassle to be, you know, having to stop at these inspection centers all the time? Um, Melanie, you know, I think generally I haven't heard much, and my role as a legislative staffer is a little limited, but I haven't heard much in the way of you know, the concern about the quarantine powers, for instance, that legislators were so focused on in the drafting of these bills haven't really heard that raised as a problem. But in terms of hassle, there are certainly, um, while I think the overall inspection stations have been received well by the public, and um, they're certainly being educated at those inspection stations, and I think people are much, much more aware there are inspection stations where there are local users um, going through those inspection stations, we have outfitters and guides taking people on rivers you know, multiple times a day. And so the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has been working to come up with a system that will make it a little easier for those folks um, to get through more quickly um, so that they don't have to answer the whole battery of questions every time. Um, they actually just um, put together a new program this year in a, in a particular area where there are a lot of outfitters um, where if they attended a class a couple of weeks ago, then they could get um, kind of a passport, I'll call it, a little booklet um, that they could keep and had an individualized number to them that they can show every time they go through the check station. They still have to stop, but they get a much more truncated inspection to try and help move them along and, and hopefully help alleviate some of that aggravation in that area. And when you were crafting the legislation or when you know the, the legislators were, to what extent did they look at what other states were doing in this area to craft their legislation? Um, they looked at uh, several states. Um, one particular was Idaho. Idaho, um, from my look at it and in, in being experienced with the drafting, was really ahead of the curve in our area and taking the lead. And so they actually had a meeting here in January on a Saturday where a few folks from Idaho were invited to speak. And they came and talked to a full house um, about their experiences and the different pieces of their program that they put together. I mentioned the, the boat decal program. They also have a passport program 
for their inspection stations so that people can move more easily and agilely around if, if they're locals and they're not in um, you know, waters that are considered to be problematic. So Montana has really looked to Idaho primarily. Um, for you, Stosh, what kind of tools or programs are being used to assess the potential risks of new invasive species, you know, modeling tools or predictions of likelihood of a species spreading or risk assessments to that extent? Okay. Uh, well, well there, there's uh, a, a number of tools along all of um, probably the, the, that set that you've just noted. Uh, historically, I think the invasive community has been more advanced on the terrestrial plant side, and the USDA's Animal Plant Health Inspection Service has a fairly new and sort of ever um, refined risk analysis, risk, risk assessment methodology for plants, which builds off of um, uh, and looks at a model that was developed in Australia. And that has been adapted uh, and used by states. Uh, Maryland is, is one example as states get into the process of having to look at uh, invasive plants in their, their own territories. Uh, on the sort of aquatic and the animal side, there are similar analogs, although maybe not as, as far advanced. Fish and Wildlife Service has a risk screening, a rapid risk screening process that is being sort of piloted out of the Great Lakes region, although their intent is that that process can be used nationally and w with the, sort of two things in mind. One, sort of to, to help folks think about what sort of things should we be looking at um, in terms of potential future concerns. Uh, servicing the broader community, and then more specifically, how does that service Fish and Wildlife Service's regulatory responsibility with regards to the Lacey Act and the need to do full risk assessments on species that are listed as being injurious. Um, there are a wide range of sort of other tools in, in that regards that might be um, sort of species or, or taxa specific. I know that a, a consortium of um, Universities in the Great Lakes region has been working with states to develop some that are specific to plants, specific to aquatic plants, um, mollusks, fish, et cetera, in that region. Uh, and then I think the, the final piece that I'll mention is on the climate side. Um, there's been a lot more work in advancing how do we do niche modeling and, um, and look at some of the potential changes in the future with regards to climatic conditions that will uh, impact whether a species gets riskier in terms of its ability to spread or, in some cases, whether its potential range will decrease. Uh, so it's, it's a very active field, both from inside federal agencies as well as um, by sort of academia and other research folks. And I think um, as we perfect these methodologies that hopefully they will be sort of expanded to fill the range of uh, needs by resource managers. Great, thanks. Um, so that actually leads into the next question that maybe I, could, I would pose to both of you. It's Josh, maybe you want to take the first crack. Um, you know, what kind of policy considerations should states that are working on developing legislation on invasive species take into account? Um, you mentioned climate change. Any other, other kind of examples that states should keep in mind um, as they're crafting their legislation? Well, I think the, the one thing, and this sort of taking a, a slightly broader perspective, and it's also building on some of what Hope was saying, is looking at what the states around them are doing. Um, both the work on the building consensus in the West and its model legislation which looks at sort of the full range of things that could be done with watercraft inspec inspection and decontamination, as well as what specific states are doing, um, is one sort of way to sort of look at and compare what's going on. Similar, I meant, Similarly, I mentioned what's going on in the, um, in the Great Lakes states with regards to which species are different states regulating. And the issue being that the weakest link in one of those states can serve as the entry point where an invasive species might establish and then spread to other states. And, and it's not to you know, force all states to, to harmonize and, and do the same thing, but it's just being conscious of if you are putting effort into prevention or work around a specific species or set of species, understanding you know, what are the, the policy dynamics um, going on with the states around you so you have an assessment or so you have an idea of what um, 
the, the potential additional risks or the potential areas for cooperation with neighboring states are. So I say that's an important dynamic in addition that states need to, to look at. And, and I think one final example that I'll, I'll give there is with uh, Emerald Ash Borer in the early days, we had state of Maryland was trying to eradicate and do as much as they could to get rid of it, whereas the state of Virginia said it's a foregone conclusion, we're just going to basically let it go. Obviously, the two states share a border, and Emerald Ash Borer was right along that border. And so it, it, it was almost comical in terms of looking at those two different responses and recognizing how they don't, um, they don't coincide very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think from our perspective, Melanie, I was talking with the folks in the room with me, um, consistency, you know, looking at what's being done around you, like Stash said, um, and then cost effectiveness. Um, Linnea Schroer said, you know, what are the highest risk practices and vectors in your area, and then focusing on those things. But again, prevention is the most cost effective rather than control. I know that Penoir um, had a meeting last fall where they got people from the region together about, you know, what do we need to be doing? And there was a lot of talk about better coordination and um, consistency. You know, if, if, if all the states have inspection stations, um, you know, are we asking the same questions? Are we finding out the same information so that the data is, um, you know, better transferable between states and, and makes more sense when you look at it all together? So consistency was a big theme in Penmar's information. Okay. Great. Um, we got a last minute question in here. How legitimate is the threat of zebra mussel expansion to New York or uh, the northeast of the U.S.? Josh, you want to take a crack at that? Um, I, I think it's it's a legitimate threat. I unfortunately I can't see sort of the the, the, the map that Hope has up just is sort of the the, the western part of the U.S. But um, I had thought that that parts of New York might oh, there we are um, are already sort of. Uh, Invaded. So I, I think it's it's a legitimate threat as well. I think the you know, the key thing and one of the lessons that the, the East is now taking a look at is this whole issue of of trailered boats and as a vector for the spread of not just fog and zebra mussels but uh, aquatic vegetation as well. And so I think some of the the areas that have been a focus of the last couple of years for Western states are gaining increasing attention in the East. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, great. Well, as it's 2 o'clock, um, I'll go ahead and wrap things up here. So thanks to you both very much for, um, you know, for your presentations. And we saw, um, we saw your contact information on Stosh, and I know that Stosh is very approachable, so feel free to contact him with any questions. Hope is as well. If you uh, want to go through me to contact Hope, um, I'm more than happy to pass along that. And we'll be uh, sending this archive recording to you all on, um, who have signed on afterwards when it's posted, and we'll also have it on our website. You can check out at ncsl.org. Um, so, uh, oh, just a reminder also, we have more Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee webinars coming up throughout the month, so you should be getting emails about that. Um, if not, check on our website, ncsl.org. Um, so with that, I'll just thank you all for your continued interest and support of NCSL and wish everyone a happy weekend.